Welcome to Raising Children is an Act of Philosophy with Roslyn Ross. And before I begin, I would like to apologize for the production values of this recording. I had hoped to wait until I had better production values to make these videos, but I am tired of being harassed. So here I am at my desk with some random curtains behind me to block the glare of my window. <laughs> um, onward. <clears throat> we'll start with what is parenting, because any discussion begins with what is this word? What does it mean? What idea does it stand for? I looked up parenting in a few dictionaries and I asked some random groups of people what parenting is and I got a variety of answers, most of which can be summarized by parenting today is the hardest job we'll ever love. What I want everyone to note about parenting being the hardest job we'll ever love is that when we think of parenting, we think of a job. The thing about jobs is that they come with job descriptions, the desire to complete the job and the goal to do a good job. So if you picture good parents doing a good job, you probably picture parents reading to their kids every night, doing homework with their kids, lots of math. Um, they probably attend every sporting event every artistic performance that their child does. They probably take their child on enriching outings like to museums and foreign countries and provide their child with memorable holidays and birthdays. They probably make sure their kid eats his vegetables and never watches too much television. Some of the job aspects that I was hired to help with over the last decade include children not doing well enough in school, children needing to lose weight, teenagers throwing tantrums, and younger children hitting, sucking their thumbs, or not potty training. Since fixing these problems is the parent's job, if they can't fix it, they hire someone who hopefully can fix it. That was my job. The problem with what I'm going to call job parenting is that when we have a job to accomplish, when we have a list of things to do and we gotta get them done, we gotta get our kid ready for bed, we, we gotta get him to school, we gotta get him into a good college, the psychology of accomplishing a job is all about the person doing the accomplishing. The other person is being accomplished upon. In my head, they are either the thing that is helping me accomplish my job or the thing that is not helping me accomplish my job. They are a thing, they're objectified. So for example, when my baby is rolling over while I'm trying to change his diaper, it's upsetting to me because he is not helping me accomplish my job of changing his diaper. My psychology becomes, what is the best way for me to get him to do what I want him to do? Should I hold him down and force him? Should I beg and plead with him, even though he's only one years old? Should I distract him? That's what most parenting books tell you to do. Distract the baby while you touch his butt and penis. The same psychological change happens in other relationships. For example, my boyfriend is not proposing to me, not helping me accomplish my goal of marrying him. My psychology again becomes, what is the best way for me to get him to do what I want him to do? Should I trick him? Get a little pregnant? Should I seduce him? guilt trip him or threaten to break up with him? Would any woman in our society ever think, huh, oh, he doesn't want to propose right now and I would never coerce someone into proposing to me when he doesn't want to, so I guess that's not gonna happen right now. I mean, would we even respect a woman who thought like that? She's obviously not a go-getter. Does she even deserve to get what she wants? In our society, Current forms of coercion are like common sense. From a disapproving glance to threats against someone's life, or an approving glance to praise or bribery, coercion is the language of our current relationship psychology. Why? For this talk, I googled how to get your husband to take out the trash. What I found was exactly what I was expecting. <laughs> My favorite line was from womensday.com. It said, reward good behavior. The sexier, the better. This method that we use, that we have been taught since birth, is called the carrot and the stick, or reward and punishment, or external control psychology. 
This psychology rests on the premise that humans can be trained just like Skinner's rats. Punish the people who are doing wrong so they will do what we say is right. Then reward them so they keep doing what we want them to do. The ideal power dynamic between a parent and a child that I have read about in so many parenting books is not too authoritarian and not too permissive. A parent should be like a benevolent dictator, praising good behavior and punishing bad behavior, always with a spirit of benevolence. I don't think it's by chance that we benevolently dictate to our children and then our government benevolently dictates to us. This job coercive psychology benevolent dictator way of seeing parenting or any relationship, it's often hard to understand why it doesn't work because it looks like it does. You can trick, coerce, and manipulate a man into marrying you. You can force children to lose weight, to get good grades, to be good athletes, to go to law school, to be anything. But you can't force them to be happy. You can give them Prozac. But you can't force people to be genuinely happy with their lives. You can't make them live authentic lives. You can't make someone be your genuine friend or propose to you because he wants to. William Glasser, who wrote a book called Choice Theory on why coercive relationships don't work, says the vast majority of unhappiness in the parent-child relationship is the result of well-intentioned parents trying to make children do what they don't want to do. It is so hard for people, especially parents, to accept how limited they are in what they can do when they are dissatisfied with how their children are behaving. They are limited to controlling their own behavior. He goes on to say one of what I think is the most important parenting quotes of all time. Few of us parents are prepared to accept that it is our attempt to control that destroys the only thing we have with our children that gives us some control over them, our relationship. This is true of any relationship, and I would say it slightly differently. It is our attempt to control that destroys the only thing we have with anyone that gives us influence over them, our relationship. So in order to understand uh, how I see parenting working more effectively, I want to pause for a moment and discuss relationship theory. So we're back at the beginning. What is a relationship? What is this word, this idea? My favorite relationship theorist, David Jay, describes the three things that must take place to call something a relationship between two people. Number one, the two people must come together and explore ways to experience spending time together. They can cuddle, play chase, change diapers, nurse, eat, sing, dance, etc. Number two, they must express how they felt about that time they spent together. I really enjoyed reading that book, Dad. I really loved seeing that movie with you, John. There must be a commitment to spend more time together. Otherwise, it's not a relationship. It's just something that happened one time. So, good night, my son. I will read you this book again tomorrow night, or I'll call you later. All of these things must be present for something to be ascribed as a relationship, and all of these things can be done in a healthy or unhealthy way, which will make that relationship either healthy or unhealthy. So number one, exploring ways to spend time together. In a healthy relationship, the two people are always looking for new ways to experience being together. And because they are present, any experience can be new. It is through these experiences that they learn about themselves and what it is that they value in life, who they are. These experiences lead to personal growth. And that is why good relationships are so satisfying. If both parties in a relationship are continuously learning about themselves, they grow and their relationship grows and deepens. When the people in a relationship stop exploring ways to be together, they stop learning about themselves, they stop growing, and the relationship becomes stagnant at first and then starts to die. 
Relationships are like gardens. They never stay the same. They're either growing or dying. So number two, both, both parties must express what they felt about the experience. In a healthy relationship, both parties express themselves freely, openly, and honestly. In an unhealthy relationship, they don't. Perhaps one person is trying to manipulate the other person. So she says she likes going camping when the truth is she just wants the guy to like her. Or perhaps it's a relationship between a parent and a child where the child would like to express himself honestly, but the parent keeps saying things like, you don't mean that. Or you love your sister. You do. You love her deep down. Or, oh, look, Uncle Mike gave you a puppet. You love it. You love it, don't you? Tell him thank you. Or, we had so much fun today, didn't we? This is not honest communication. Number three, for a relationship to be healthy, commitments must be made and kept. A relationship in which you cannot trust the other person to be there when he said he would is not headed in a healthy direction. Now, there's another type of commitment that can turn unhealthy, and that is the long-term commitment, like deciding to be best friends or get married. A parent-child relationship is a type of long-term committed relationship. It's not a voluntary one like friendship or marriage. It's a long-term commitment that we are born into. Long-term committed relationships have a special potential to become toxic because they almost always come with job descriptions best friend, wife, father. These words are relationship commitment descriptions, but they are also job descriptions. We have a cultural idea of what it means to be a good friend, a good wife, a good father. These job descriptions can lead people to cease being in a relationship and instead take on a job. And when you have a job to do, that leads to the psychology we just discussed. When we think of parenting, we think of a job. When we turn a relationship into a job, it's no longer a healthy relationship. The way we think about parenting is not healthy. Our conception of good parent requires us to have an unhealthy relationship with our children. To illustrate why it's so unhealthy to turn a relationship into a job, Imagine a new husband takes on the job of being a good husband. He starts mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, reading to the kids, helping his wife with the dishes. He gets the highest paying job he can and works his tail off. And at first he's patting himself on the back and he's going, I am such a good husband. But after a while, he starts to feel like being a good husband is a huge obligation, a chore a long list of things to do. It's not fun anymore. He's starting to resent his wife and see her as some kind of slave driver. The reason being a good boy has made him so unhappy is that he's following a pre-written script. He's not learning or discovering or growing. And without growth, there is no life. The other reason it's so unhealthy is who wrote the script? It wasn't the husband. Henry David Thoreau published a rather well-known book called Walden in 1854. It's a true story about how he wanted to build a cabin in the woods to discover himself and what life was all about for him. His neighbors thought he was a little weird, but uh, this is what he wanted to do, so he did it. What he learned and wrote about is that the secret of life is following your heart. Whatever weird ideas you have, whatever fascinates you, whatever brings you joy or peace, follow it. It will take you on a magical journey. Many people who read Walden think that what Thoreau was trying to say is that the secret of life is living in a cabin in the woods. This is a misunderstanding. You must advance confidently in the direction of your dreams, he said. According to Joseph Campbell, the foremost scholar on the religions and myths of mankind, our misunderstanding with Thoreau's teaching is similar to our misunderstandings with the teachings of religion. Someone writes a book about how he found his bliss, and pretty soon we're trying to follow his path to bliss instead of our own. 
and then we spend our lives doing what we think we have been told when all along what we were actually told was to look within, that the kingdom of heaven lies within you. One of the reasons we so often succumb to following someone else's script is that it's easier. It's the beaten path. Ayn Rand said, it's the hardest thing in the world just to do what you want. The other reason we so often succumb to following someone else's script is that it has a social function almost always encouraged by those in power. Scripts enable people to be in power. Joseph Campbell says they make us easier to control because they homogenize our behavior. He says the primary function of our script is to integrate the individual into his group, to infuse the individual in the system of sentiments so that each individual can be relied upon to respond in an anticipated way, an expectable way, to the stimuli that that group and world offers. One of my favorite professors at Wesleyan, Katch Talolian, said it even better. Those who create normal rule the world. Whether it's, this is what a nursery looks like, this is what an education looks like. This is what an expertise in child rearing looks like. Whether it's the rule that you must remember your girlfriend's birthday or you're a bad boyfriend, or you must attend your friend's wedding or you're a bad friend, our internal job descriptions that are not ours have tremendous power over us. The parenting job description is perhaps the most important script to control. Every conqueror since antiquity has known that you don't have to worry about the people you have conquered. You just take over how their children are raised. So let's take a closer look at our parenting script. We pictured it earlier, but let's take a look at the lives that are created by following this script. What does it produce? If you decide to be a good parent, doing all those things that you believe a good parent does, what will be the, what will be the outcome? So first, it produces miserable parents. <laughs> study after study has shown that non-parents are happier on a day-to-day -day basis than parents. If you follow the good parent script, it is highly likely you will find parenting to be a grueling, exhausting, bank-breaking, guilt-ridden, marriage-killing, 20-year power struggle. Second, the product of the typical American childhood and this parenting style is not only a problem here, but it's easier to do the numbers for one country. And I got these new numbers all from government websites and a few from Wikipedia. The average product of our script grows into an adult who gets an AA degree, makes $28,000 a year when he's young and $42,000 a year by the time he's old, is overweight or obese, gets four colds a year and spends 20% of his income on medical problems. He will be permanently on at least one prescription drug by the time he's 35 and three by the time he's 45. One of these drugs will likely be a mood altering drug like an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety. He will get married, have two kids, and most likely get divorced. He will spend most of his free time watching television. The part nature plays aside, how we are raising our children creates this adult. Who wants to be that adult? Because I don't want to be that person. And I don't want my son to be that person. Do you want to be that person? Why are we creating that person? Who benefits from the existence of that person? The families that I worked for were in the top 1% of income earners in the country, but statistically, their kids grow into very similar adults. The top 1% of Americans have better college degrees and make a lot more money, but they're still overweight and unhealthy. They get lots of colds. They have even more medical problems. They are even more likely to be on prescription drugs and especially mood altering ones. They will spend just as much time watching television and be slightly less likely to get divorced. Rich or poor, our current parenting script creates unhappy parents and unhappy, unhealthy children. This has been the case for a long time now and whenever these facts come to light, the powers that be change the script Oh, we were just kidding. Don't spank your kids. Put them in timeout. But they don't change the premise that there should be a script at all. This is where the philosophy of parenting begins. Parenting right now is how we control our subordinates, which is how those above us control us, which is why we try to control everyone around us in the same way. 
why we think the way we think about control, power, force, and aggression. I think there is a better way. I propose that we reject the job model of parenting. I propose that we reject all scripts that have been written for us. I propose that we reject external control psychology, and instead we make our one and only parenting goal to have a healthy relationship with our offspring. If we want to adopt a healthy relationship parenting philosophy, we must start with the assumption that every person, including the young people we refer temporarily to as children, have a right to exist for his or her own sake, and we don't need to have power over anyone. If we want to adopt a healthy relationship parenting philosophy, we must also start with the assumption that the only power, the only control we have over our children is the quality of the relationship we create. This means that we no longer have to read any books on how to discipline or how to get them to do what we want them to do, how to make them succeed in school, how to make them do. But we would benefit from the study of relationship psychology, emotional health, and good communication skills, things that will help you in every area of your life. When we get rid of this paradigm, if we don't get to tell our children what to learn and who to be, if we don't get to shape them or control them with reward and punishment, we have to accept that the best form of teaching available to us, the best way to influence who they become, is modeling. This turns parenting on its head because all we get to do as parents is be the best people we can be. And this actually turns out to be perfect because regardless of what we think we're teaching our children with all of our control and rewards and punishment, what we actually teach is who we are. Nathaniel Brandon says that all we teach is what we are. Since all we teach our children is what we are, we have to spend a little bit more time thinking about what we are. Instead of obsessing over our children and trying to control them and trying to force them into the person we dream they could be, we can only focus on ourselves and make ourselves the person we dream of being. Instead of reward and punish, instead of how can I get him to do what I want him to do, the healthy relationship model of parenting becomes be the hero you wish to see in your children. I'm going to conclude this talk with some scenarios and examples because often when I explain this philosophy, people get a little bit fuzzy, like they're thinking, is she really saying the solution is not controlling our children? I mean, wouldn't that be all chaos and gang warfare? So um, some example situations, and these are from brilliant books that are already out there. I'm going to use a newborn because many people think they could possibly have a non-coercive relationship with older children, but they don't know how they would have a non-coercive relationship with a lump. So uh, the scenario is a newborn baby and how he is fed. The job mom sees it as her job to get food into the baby. So she brings the baby to her breast. She tickles his cheek because when you do that, they open their mouth. She puts her breast in his mouth far enough to activate his sucking reflex. The relationship mom does not think it would be respectful to just put something in someone's mouth, even a little baby. So she brings the baby to her breast so that her nipple is near his nose and he can smell what she's offering. If he wants to nurse, he must turn his own head and open his own mouth. Scenario two, a newborn baby and when he is fed. The job mom knows she is supposed to feed her baby every two hours. She has a handy little device that goes off every two hours, so she knows it's time to feed the baby. If he acts hungry before the two hours is up, she distracts him so that he learns to wait two hours. The relationship mom knows to question every rule, so she thinks in the history of the human race, clocks have only been around for a little while especially clocks with little devices that go off every two hours. So instead of following this arbitrary script, she decides to follow her heart. And I'm not saying this is what every mom would feel, but this one knows her baby. This little person cannot eat unless she helps him. So she decides that making him wait is disrespectful and that it won't help their relationship. So she feeds her baby when he acts hungry. Maybe it's been one hour. Maybe it's been three. 
So to recap, the healthy relationship mom's baby has been empowered twice, made responsible for eating and for letting his mom know when he's hungry. He must learn to pay attention to his hunger cues and he must learn to communicate that to his mom. She must learn to receive his communication. They are developing a relationship. The job mom's baby has been disempowered twice. Food will be shoved in his mouth when he wants it or not, and it will be done when the clock says whether he is hungry or not. For the moms, the relationship mom is getting in tune with her baby. The job mom is getting in tune with her alarm clock. And whether she means to or not, showing her, she is showing her baby who's in power. It's not him. Interestingly enough, it's also not her. She's just doing what she was told. Now the baby is older. Let's say he's teething and he bites his mom. The job mom believes it is her job to teach her child not to bite people. So when he bites her, she gives him a disapproving look. She says, bad boy, no biting. And then she picks him up and she puts him in timeout for one minute because that's how old timeouts are when you're one year old. The relationship mom first responds authentically to what happened. She says, ow, you bit me, that hurt. She looks her baby straight in the eye, communicating with him. She says, I can't let you bite me. But she looks around, she finds a doll. She says, you want to bite. Here is something you can bite, it won't hurt the doll. The job mom's baby has learned that he is bad, that his desire to bite is bad, that some people get to have power over others and that he is not in power and that he has to please those in power. You'll be punished if you don't please people. He's learning to be a people pleaser. The relationship mom's baby has learned that biting hurts his mom but it is valid for him to want what he wants. He wants to bite and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with him. He's not a bad person. No one gets to judge him. There's no shame. But other people won't allow themselves to be hurt by him. He is learning non-aggression. This way of thinking about your child as a whole person with needs and desires worthy of your respect just continues as the child gets older. I'll do one more example still using feeding. Now we have a four-year-old. The job mom still believes it is her job to get food into her child and to make sure he eats his vegetables. In order to get food into him, she does a variety of things from bribing him with dessert or cooking whatever he likes best because if she tries to make something other than macaroni and cheese, he won't eat. In order to make sure he gets some vegetables, she spends a great deal of time and goes to great lengths to make various purees to sneak them into his food. The relationship mom knows that she has to eat dinner and shares whatever she makes for herself with her child, just as she has since he was a baby. Tonight she makes ratwurst, sauerkraut, and mashed potatoes. What her child decides to do at this point is his business. She talks to him during dinner. She doesn't even look at his plate. The job mom's child has learned that he has to eat whether he is hungry or not. His mom has made that very clear by desperately cooking whatever he wants just so that he will eat it and by begging him to take just one more bite and by rewarding him with dessert when he finishes his plate. He has been taught to not listen to his body. The relationship mom's child has been in charge of his eating since he was a baby. He has been eating whatever his mom makes since he was a baby. Sometimes he eats it, sometimes he doesn't, especially if it's a new food. Sometimes he doesn't even taste it. He eats vegetables when he wants to, but there's never been any pressure or guilt. He's not a good boy or a bad boy. He has no guilt associated with food. Eating is all his deal, his responsibility. He has learned that his mother trusts him to take care of himself in this way. He has learned to trust his body, to tell him how much to eat. He has learned that his thoughts and opinions are valid. Um, so those are my examples. To conclude, the new definition of parenting is, uh, according to me, is the opportunity to co-create and enjoy a healthy relationship with one's offspring. Uh, thank you very much.